Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this event, Modernism in Ukraine, 1900 to 1930s, um, both exhibition and a presentation of a book launch. Um, I'm Dr. Charlotte Merlin, I'm the Associate Lecturer here at the Courtauld Institute, and it's a real delight and pleasure to welcome you all this evening. Um, the event is co-organised um, with the Ukrainian Institute of London, which um, we think is a first between the Ukrainian Institute and the Courtauld, so we're really delighted um, that this collaboration is, is, is going ahead as well. Um, so collaboration with the Ukrainian Institute London, with the Courtauld, um, where you are, and um, Cambridge Ukrainian Studies. Um, and I think it's a first for us to work with you as well, so um, it's very, um, very exciting that we're all in one place. Um, the Ukrainian Institute London champions Ukrainian culture and shapes the conversation about Ukraine in the UK and beyond. Equally, Cambridge Ukrainian Studies is an academic study, uh, academic centre at the University of Cambridge, which aims to promote and contribute to the study of Ukraine in this country and outside it. So our panel this evening, um, I will introduce, um, it's a real pleasure to have Katya Denisova, a PhD candidate here at the Courtauld, um, and co-curator of the exhibition in the eye of the storm, modernism in Ukraine, 1900 to 1930. So she will present the exhibition and the accompanying book. Um, she'll then be joined for an in-conversation um, with um, Alenka Pevny, Associate Professor in Ukrainian Studies um, and Medieval and Early Modern Slavonic Studies at Cambridge, and Constance Urishin, a PhD candidate in, at the Slavonic Studies at University of Cambridge and the Cultural Industries Advisor to the Ukrainian Institute in London. Um, and our discussion this evening will be followed by um, a Q&A um, and, uh, and then some drinks um, in the research forum, um, which is just back towards the lifts where you've come from and then it's just on the right hand side, um, and copies of the wonderful catalogue. Um, will be available for sale there as well. So without more from me, I'd like to hand over to Katya. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, for this introduction, and good evening, everyone. Uh, before I do my presentation, I want to start with a short round of thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you for being here with us tonight and showing interest in learning more about Ukrainian art and culture. It's the best um, sign of support and solidarity with our country that we can um, have right now, so thank you for that. I'm absolutely honored to be doing this event in partnership with the Ukrainian Institute London that does amazing work to promote all things Ukrainian. If you're not familiar with their work yet, do check out their website, subscribe to their newsletter, follow them on Instagram and YouTube. They have an amazing lineup of events about Ukrainian history, culture, literature, language, um, all things Ukrainian. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Dr. Rolanka Perne and Constance Uzvishin from uh, University of Cambridge, and I really much look forward to our conversation after my presentation. Last but not least, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be doing this event in my home institution at the Port Hotel, and I'm very grateful to Charlotte and to um, our colleagues at the Research Forum for making this happen. So, um, as Charlotte said, what I will do today, I will uh, present the exhibition, um, or more broadly the project, which is called In the Eye of the Storm, Modernism in Ukraine, 1900 to 1930s, which is a two-fold project. So it consists of the exhibition, which is currently on view um, in Madrid at the thyssen bornemisza uh, National Museum there. And another uh, integral part of that uh, project is uh, the publication, which was produced by Tansom Hudson and published last November to coincide with the opening of uh, the show in Madrid. And this is just a title page from, uh, from the catalog. So I had an incredible joy to be part of the curatorial and editorial team for this uh, project, working alongside Konstantina Kinsha, who's a freelance art historian, historian and curator from Ukraine. And we worked in close partnership with the National Art Museum of Ukraine, especially its director, Yulia Lefkines, and with Olana kashuba Vodovich, who is the curator of 19th century and early 20th century art at the museum. And she joined us on the curatorial and editorial team. So, the way I will structure today's talk, I will walk you through the exhibition, uh, so the, the thematic sections that we have in the exhibition, highlighting some of the artists and artworks that we have on view. And this will also allow me to explore some of our ideas and thinking that we had when we were working on this project and putting it um, together, and also highlighting some of the challenges that we had. 
Uh, one of the challenges was the incredibly short time frame in which we had to produce um, both the exhibition and the catalog. So it took us around six to seven months to put it all together, which is um, incredible, <laughs> I think. Um, but it also means that this is a very much a point of departure and there is more work and more research that needs to be done, and especially with the catalog. We, uh, we hope that it will be a good introduction to the field, but this is by no means an exhaustive um, study. Another important thing to note is that when we talk about uh, modernism in Ukraine in the context of our uh, project, what we are actually referring to and the art that we're working with is uh, the so known right bank Ukraine. So it's the, the right bank of the Dnipro River, so eastern and central of Ukraine, that during the indicated period, during the first three decades of the 20th century, it was under the Russian Empire initially that there was a short-lived um, independent state of Ukrainian People's Republic, and then it was transferred into the Soviet Union. So with the exhibition in particular, we concentrate on the cities of Kiev and Kharkiv, and then in the catalog we also have a section dedicated to Odessa. Um, so what we Kind of the, the, the logical question is what's excluded, and what's excluded is uh, Western Ukraine and cities such as Lviv that were initially part of the Austro Hungarian Empire and then were moved um, to Poland. Um, and this is not to say that there were no links and no um, interactions between cultural Ukrainian cultural practitioners working on the two sides of the divide, imperial divide, but um, it this kind of Again, the investigation of these links and interconnectivity, it requires more time and more research and which just outside the scope of our project. Um, I think I will stop here with the introduction. So, this, the exhibition in Madrid, which is on view until the end of the month, um, it is comprised of 69 artworks. Uh, 51 of those were uh, transferred out of Ukraine, so they come from the collections of two institutions in Ukraine, the National Art Museum of Ukraine and the Museum of Theatre, Music and Cinema Arts of Ukraine. Uh, we were kind of transferring shipping the works um, in last November um, and I will not go into the details of all the challenges and complexities um, we were presented with when um, taking works out of a uh, country at war because I think pretty much every journalist who has covered the, the exhibition has written about that, so there is a lot of information out there. What I do want to highlight and commend is the incredible work of our colleagues in Ukraine who had to put this exhibition to prepare works to be shipped and to be exhibited in the most difficult circumstances. So last fall, this was the period when um, Russia was launching pretty much weekly massive missile attacks on Ukraine. There were um, never-ending air raid sirens that could go on for hours and hours. Um, constant power cuts as um, the infrastructure was uh, targeted and hit. Um, very often our colleagues in Ukraine, they had to stay overnight in museums because they were just not making it home before the curfew. So I just want to express my sincere gratitude and admiration for the enthusiasm and dedication that they showed and uh, make sure that the works from the Ukrainian collections are presented in the best possible, best possible way um, in, in Europe. Um, kind of the structure of the exhibition in Madrid it, uh, is split into seven thematic sections, but the, the narrative also unfolds chronologically. So we start the exhibition in the 1910s and we finish in the 1930s, and uh, one of the important things for us was to situate art production within the broader or kind of complex fabric of social social political transformations that were happening in Ukraine at the time. So this is just a shot of the timeline that we have at the introduction of the exhibition, but we also refer to some of the pivotal moments, historical events throughout um, in all of the war texts that we have in the exhibition. And some of the key moments are obviously the First World War and then the collapse of the Romanos Empire, the creation of the independent Ukrainian People's Republic, the war between the Soviets and uh, Ukrainian pro-independence Ukrainian governments, and then the eventual creation of the USSR. Um, so the first section that we have in, in the exhibition is dedicated to Cubofuturism. And these are works that were created by artists in Ukraine, working in Ukraine, or coming from Ukraine in the 1910s. And these are probably some of the most um, experimental and radical works that we have in the show. So um, it is important to um, know that 
there were obviously a lot of um, links uh, for Ukrainian artists with um, the centers of the Russian Empire, such as Moscow and St. Petersburg, because artists in Ukraine, they couldn't complete their art education um, at home. There was no art academy, there was no art, high art school in Ukraine for them to go to. So um, initially they went to Moscow and to St. Petersburg, but very um, kind of during this period, their attention and their focus moved to Western Europe. So they would increasingly go to places like Munich, Vienna, and Paris. And two of the better known names that we have in the exhibition are um, David Burluk and Alexandra Exter. So Burluk, he studied in Munich, Exter, she studied in Paris. And it was in, in this center that they learned about the new trends that were developed there, such as Cubism and Futurism, and they worked to reinterpret them, and very often they combined uh, elements of the two, and hence cubofuturism as a term. But what, what they also did, they infused this art with some of the local elements. So they, they looked to Ukrainian decorative art and some of the compositional um, elements and chromatic elements of Ukrainian decorative art. They also worked a lot with Ukrainian folklore. Um, Another, um, so these two names are kind of a little bit recognizable in the West. We also have, um, especially in this section, we have artists who are not particularly known. So, Vadim Mele, Alexander Bogomazov, and Volodymyr Burluk. And I want particularly to focus on this painting by Volodymyr Burluk, who was the younger brother of David. Very tragically, he died in the First World War, so there are not that many canvases for, by him out there. And a rare example is this stunning painting, which actually comes from the collection of the Thyssen um, Museum. And it was very interesting for us to collaborate with an institution that has, a, well, I, I mean Thyssen, that has a very large collection of the so-called Russian avant-garde. And this painting was part of that, or is part of that collection. And I think it was a sort of two-way um, communication and two-way uh, process of us being influenced by working with such an institution, but then also learning from us and kind of being stimulated to rethink and reassess how they work with this collection, with the collection of Russian avant-garde that they have um, in, in their holdings. Um, so that's kind of one of the rewarding um, elements of um, this project. And I, I want to quickly and briefly touch on the um, term of Russian avant-garde, which is um, a fairly artificial construct that was created in the 1970s and 1980s. It's problematic for many reasons, but one of the main ones is because it promotes a very Russocentric interpretation of art and artists that worked in a very multicultural environment of the Russian Empire, late Soviet Union. Um, so one of the goals of our project was to challenge these Russocentric interpretations and to shift the focus and show that in, in this case, in our case, Ukrainian context matter and we need to be aware of it and we need to acknowledge it. Um, and one other work that I will show from this section is this, um, it's huge, um, this painting by Vladimir Barana Fasine. So in the, both in the catalog and in the exhibition, we also try to address the question of emigre artists, so artists who were born in Ukraine, but they developed artistically and matured elsewhere. So Barana Fasine, he came from southern Ukraine and then he uh, went to Russia proper to study and eventually emigrated to uh, to, the, um, to, to France. And um, another artist that we look at in our, our project, another emigre artist, is Sonia Delaunay, for example. Um, very tragically, uh, because he was Jewish, Barana Farsine um, died in Auschwitz during the Second World War. Continuing with this um, Jewish theme, um, second section that we have in, in the um, exhibition is called Culturally, uh, Culturally or Cultural League. So this was a secular organization that was set up in Kiev in 1918 to promote all aspects of um, Yiddish or Jewish um, culture. And um, it was created in this very interesting um, environment, social political environment that was promoted by the leaders of the Ukrainian People's Republic, where they looked at um, Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine as a very multi-ethnic and multicultural space. And this approach very much informed our own thinking when we were working on this exhibition. So we want to recognize and celebrate Ukraine as a multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnic space. And that's why we included the section on the culture to Durliga in our exhibition. And it also informed the title of our project. We specifically called it Modernism in Ukraine and not Ukrainian Modernism. So um, 
Kultur Liga became an extremely um, active organization and it has its own dedicated art section which attracted many um, young Jewish artists from across the Russian Empire and um, artists such as Elisitsky, for example, came to Kiev in 1918 and worked there. So the painting by Elisitsky is in the middle of this photograph um, and all of these works are coming from the collection of the National Art Museum of Ukraine. Another painting that I wanted to show you um, within this section is this um, beautiful work by Sarah Shore. Um, it is not on view in Madrid. It will be exhibited in Cologne, which is our next stop of the tour. And the reason why I wanted to show it, well, A, it's beautiful, and B, Sarah Shore is not a particularly known artist either in Ukraine or outside it. And one of the things that we wanted to do with our project is to highlight gaps in the research and indicate where there is room for more work uh, to be done. And it would be brilliant if there would be a monograph on Sarah Shore sometime soon. <coughs> Um, moving on, the next section in the exhibition that we have is dedicated to theater design. And um, theater design, well, probably theater became one of the most experimental visual forms in Ukraine in the late 1910s and 1920s. And two individuals who were sort of catalysts of this revolution in theater, in particular, were Alexandra Exter, who I mentioned previously, and Leish Kurbas. So um, Exter was probably the first artist to explore principles of cubism in theater design. In 1919, she opened a, a private studio in Kiev where she gave classes to adults and children, but she also had a separate course on stage design, which was probably the first time when, this, um, when stage design was taught as a separate discipline um, altogether. And all of them um, sort of leftist or progressist, progressivist artists um, who were in Kiev at the time, they were either attending classes at her studio or they were affiliated with it in one way or another. And um, from this studio emerged a whole generation of um, theater designers, um, not only Soviet Ukraine, but also outside it. We don't have um, examples of extra theater design on view in Madrid, but we will add them to Cologne, uh, which is uh, great news. Um, and so two artists who we focus on in this section in Madrid are Vadim Meller, who worked very closely uh, with Exter, and you can see that there was definitely a stylistic inspiration and um, kind of encounter of influences going on here. Um, so the second catalyst of revolution in theater that I mentioned was Leish Kurbas, and he was um, probably one of the most experimental theater directors in Soviet, definitely in Soviet Ukraine, but also in Soviet Union more broadly, and Europe potentially. And um, Vadim Meiler was one of his leading artistic um, directors, so they collaborated on pretty much um, every production that Les Kurbas did with um, his Berezi Theater, which was set up in Kiev, but then moved to Kharkiv. Um, another important artist um, in this respect is Anatoly Petritsky, who was also close to, he attended Extra Studio, and then he worked with Kurbas as well. We don't have these two works in Madrid, but we are working on getting them uh, for other um, iterations of the exhibition, but I wanted to show them because I just love them. I think they're so uh, humorous and whimsical, and uh, they kind of um, embody this Ukrainian spirit in a very nice way. Um, they're quite big, and what you cannot see from the images is that they're quite multi-textural, so Petritsky used different materials to put these um, costumes together. So it's, it's a joy to look at them, and I hope we'll be able to show them to, um, to the public. Um, moving on. The next section that we have in the exhibition is dedicated to Kharkiv of the 1920s. So when the Ukrainian People's Republic was defeated by the Bolsheviks um, and the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic was uh, created in 1922, Kharkiv became the capital of Soviet Ukraine. And so the city transformed into this hub of creativity and many of the prominent Ukrainian artists, writers, theater directors, they all moved to Kharkiv during this period. Another important um, social political um, change or aspect to note here is that uh, it was in the 1920s that the Bolsheviks introduced the, nation, the nationalities policy known as Karinizatsi or indigenization. And this policy looked to promote um, local uh, national cultures and languages in each constituent republic of the USSR. 
So in Ukraine, this policy came to be known as Ukrainization or Ukrainization. And what it meant is that uh, for the first time probably in centuries, Ukrainian intellectual elite finally got a chance to really develop their own culture and their language and sort of um, fight this uh, provincialization and forced crucification that was enforced on it for centuries of uh, imperial rule. So in this section, we have works by Anatoly Petritsky, who I mentioned before, and Boris Kosarev, but probably the, the artist that we um, highlight the most is Vasil Yermilov, who was a native of Kharkiv, and he spent most of his life in his hometown. And he's best known as a constructivist artist, and um, he created reliefs such as this one. Um, again, this one is not on view in Madrid, but we're hoping to get it um, later on. What we do have on view in Madrid is um, Yermilov's graphic design and his works on paper, such as a series of these four sketches that um, Yermilov created when he was uh, doing wall paintings for the Red Army Club in Kharkiv in 1920. And what's important to um, kind of observe about Yermilov's art during this period is he was very much engaging in, in monumental propaganda, monumental Soviet propaganda, and um, his art was um, in line with sort of the slogans of the day. But at the same time, he recognized that um, he was uh, addressing new audience, and that audience was not just proletarian, it was Ukrainian proletarian. And so again, he incorporated elements of Ukrainian folklore and um, Ukrainian decorative art into his works during this period, which is extremely interesting. This is another painting by Anatoly Petritsky that we have in the Kharkiv section. And um, this work uh, represented Ukraine at the Venice Biennale of 1930. So in 1928 and 1930, Ukraine or Soviet Ukraine was allowed to have its own uh, dedicated section within the Soviet pavilion at the um, Biennale. And so this work by Petritsky represented Ukraine among 16 other works in 1930. We have another uh, painting in, in, in the exhibition that was shown by Zan, and I'll, um, I'll come back to it, or I'll go get to it a bit later. But in 1928, and I'm moving to the next section in the exhibition, the group that represented Ukraine at the Venice Biennale were the so-called Boychukis. And so this was a, an artistic group or a school that was created by Mikhailo Boychuk, who was a native of um, Halicina or Halicia in Western Ukraine. And he really aspired to create a new Ukrainian style, but that, the style that will be very much drawing on um, influences, you know, artistic influences from across the world and the epochs. So um, some of the key um, style that he worked with was about the Byzantine uh, tradition and then uh, pre-Renaissance uh, Italian masters such as Giotto, um, and also uh, Ukrainian folk traditions. And in the exhibition we have this painting by Mikhailo Boychuk, which is a rare survival, and I will explain why a little bit later. And we can see sort of the characteristic elements of Boychuk's style in this uh, painting. In 1917, he came to Kiev, and he was one of the founding members of the Ukrainian Academy of Art. So this was the first institution of higher art education that was uh, established in Ukraine. And um, its founding was very much uh, sponsored by the Ukrainian People's Republic, that uh, Mikhailo Bovshevsky as its first president, um, in recognition that they really need to set up national cultural um, institutions. And so Bajchuk, um, he ran a studio of fresco mosaics and tempera um, works at the Kiev at the Academy. Um, when Soviet Ukraine was set up, Bajchuk stayed in Ukraine, he didn't emigrate, and um, his studio emerged as a um, leading artistic group of Soviet Ukraine, and that's why there were even such a, a prominent um, spot at the Venice Biennale in 1928. And what they also did, they, they received numerous state commissions to produce public art all over Soviet Ukraine, so they created lots and lots of murals, very monumental works that um, decorated uh, public spaces and buildings. Um, I will return to the Wojciechis at the end of my talk. I just wanted to show you a couple more works that we have in the exhibition from this group. So this uh, painting by Manuel Shachman, which deals with a very difficult and complicated question of Jewish problems um, in Ukraine. This painting was included um, in the Ukrainian section at the Biennale in 1928. I also wanted to highlight that there were quite a few female artists working in Boychuk's group. Unfortunately, we don't have this works on view in Madrid, but we 
we do, we, they are reproduced in the catalogs, and we talk about um, female artists such as Oksana Pavlenko and Antonina Ivanova, who were uh, very active and involved members of the Chubas group. Um, moving on, and this is a penultimate section in the exhibition, it's dedicated to the Kiev Art Institute, which was the heir of the Ukrainian Academy of Art. So in the 1920s, uh, the Academy was transformed into the Institute, and um, its curriculum was brought in line with the sort of, sort of changed social political regime, but also in line with new trends in contemporary art. So they would have courses dedicated to production design, for example, which was not the case before. And in the 1920s, Kiev Art Institute became one of the leading art schools in the Soviet Union, and uh, many kind of prominent leftist artists they came to teach in Kiev at the time, and that included Kazimir Malevich and Vladimir Tatlin, for example. Um, in, in our exhibition, so we have a work by Malevich, and I'll come back to it, but two other artists uh, who taught um, at the Cape Art Institute during this period were Alexander Bogomazov, whose works we have at the beginning of the exhibition, and Viktor Feynman. And I want to specifically look at this painting by Bogomazov, which is one of the highlights of our exhibition, um, because I think it embodies the, 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 the change in art. So. Um, during this period, artists still continued to experiment with visual form, as we can see in this painting, but and it's especially striking in the work of Bogomazov and Malevich, for example, they returned to figuration. So Malevich and Bogomazov, they, they were practicing pretty much, well, Malevich definitely, Bogomazov saw, they were practicing abstract art, but in the 1920s, they decided to return to representational art. And I think what kind of why this hybridity happened is again because they were trying to adjust to the changed social political circumstances and recognizing that they need to create art that will be a bit more accessible to their new um, audience. Um, so Bogomazov worked on a series of work dedicated to uh, the work of Sawyers um, in the late 1920s. And um, it looks like he envisioned it to look, to, he, he envisioned to have three canvases that would look a little bit like a triptych. Um, he managed to complete the central and the right side um, panel, but he sadly died from tuberculosis in 1930 before he managed to complete the final one. We have some um, sketches available, and Bogomasa did numerous sketches in preparation for this work um, that show how he intended the scriptic to look. And the central panel was um, another painting that was exhibited at the Venice Biennale as part of the Ukrainian section in 1913. I cannot not talk about Malevich, um, so we have one uh, work on paper by him in the exhibition. It's a two-sided um, work, and you can see it, um, so it's on the planes here, you need to walk around it to um, see both sides. Um, Malevich was teaching at the institute in the late 1920s, uh, the Kiev Art Institute. He was also, he published a series of articles in the, one of the leading artistic journals of Soviet Ukraine, Nova Generatia, or New Generation. He was a member of one of the artistic groups in Soviet Ukraine. His last um, one-man uh, exhibition, retrospective exhibition, was uh, done at the Kiev Picture Gallery in 1930. So he was very much embedded in the cultural processes of Soviet Ukraine during this period. And um, in 1930, he created this sketch because there was an idea that he might be commissioned to do uh, frescoes for the old Ukrainian Society um, Scientific uh, Academy of Sciences. He didn't get that commission, but we have this work um, left, um, and kind of he's thinking of what he might do there. Um, this is the only work by Malevich, or uncontestedly by him, that we have in Ukrainian collections. So it's, a, uh, it's amazing that we have it in our exhibition. And wrapping up, so the last section that we have in the show is dedicated to the so-called um, last generation. So these are artists who, most of them were graduates of the Kiev Art Institute, and they uh, studied under the likes of Bogomazov, Malevich, uh, Palmov. So they learned this um, kind of modernist experimentation from their teachers, but they matured artistically um, in a, again, changing social political um, environment and that had a direct effect not only on the art that they produced, but also on their Destinies. Um, so in 1932, socialist realism was introduced as the only official artistic style to be practiced in across the Soviet Union. Um, this also coincided with the curtailing of the Ukrainization policy um, in, in, in the 1930s. And um, from then on, kind of Stalin consolidated his grip on power, and all the processes, cultural and political, across the Soviet Union were centralized. 
And um, in the late 1930s saw um, a horrific um, unleashing of horrific purges across uh, the Soviet Union and very much so in Soviet Ukraine. So many of the artists, writers, um, theater directors, they were accused of being bourgeois nationalists um, and uh, that, that Dustiny befell Mikhailo Boychuk and many members of his school and they were all executed. Um, that also happened to Corbus and, and hundreds of other um, members of Ukrainian intelligen uh, intelligentsia. And um, their works were either destroyed, so all of the public murals that the Boychukis did, uh, they all were systematically destroyed. We don't have a single example left of their public art. And the works that were not destroyed were put into the so-called Spetsfond, um, which is like a secret um, holding uh, that was created um, at the what today is National Art Museum of Ukraine in Kiev in the 1930s. And so all the works that were deemed inappropriate by the regime for one reason or another, either because they were created by bourgeois nationalists or because um, they were too formalistic, they were put into this um, Spetsfond. And in many cases their destiny was destruction. It is um, miraculous that uh, the works actually survived. Um, and in our catalog, the final essay that we have in the catalog is dedicated to the space fund and it was written by Yulia Litvanets, the director of the National Art Museum. And it's a fascinating read um, outlining how the space fund was created and what happened, why the works were not destroyed. Even though they were not destroyed, and this is the final image that I'm showing you, um, this is the kind of state that they uh, were uncovered <laughs> in uh, when the uh, space fund was um, opened. Um, so Bogomazov's works um, ended up in the Spitz font, and um, this is how this uh, painting worked before it was restored by the conservators at the National Art Museum of Ukraine in 2016. Um, I will conclude here. I will show you two more slides. So these are details of the exhibition tour. Uh, from Madrid, uh, the show will travel to Cologne, uh, where it will open this summer. The last stop for this year will be Brussels, and then next year we have secured venues in Vienna and in London. I'm not allowed yet to disclose which venues exactly, but uh, stay tuned, <laughs> this will be announced soon. And um, last but not least, I want to once again highlight the importance of this publication for our project. And I want to express uh, sincere gratitude for our amazing team at Thompson Hudson, uh, who worked around the globe to make it uh, possible. As Shara said, copies will be available for purchase um, during the drinks reception, but you can also buy them online on Thompson Hudson website. You can use this promo code to get a bit of a discount. Um, so that's all for me for now. Uh, thank you very much. Right. That was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Pevney and I will just spend about 15 to 20 minutes and ask you some questions or make some comments. Let me just breeze a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll ask long-winded questions. <laughs> okay, <great. laughs> and then afterwards we'll open to Q&A and then um, we'll have a closing um, little discussion from our Deputy De Director from the Ukraine Institute of London. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask you about the title um, of the exhibition, In the Eye of the Storm. Um, maybe you would like to elaborate on that and discuss what the impact has been of this exhibition and um, what is what could be done moving forward with this exhibition. Um, yes, sure. So in the Eye of the Storm, I guess what we were trying to highlight with this title is that this was an incredibly turbulent uh, period um, in Ukrainian history and uh, a period that affected um, the country and uh, the people and many of the artists, they were caught up in this um, constantly changing and shifting uh, social political um, landscape. Um, so I think that kind of was the idea that informed our uh, choice of the title. In terms of the impact, um, so far the exhibition has been very well received and we've had a lot of press coverage, which is um, amazing. We've also, um, so when we started working on the exhibition last February, we obviously were approaching many um, institutions across Europe and very often the answer was very interesting, but we don't have budget or we are booked up until 2026, so let's maybe discuss it then. 
Uh, but after we opened in Madrid, uh, we had some of those institutions coming back to us saying, well, actually, we have an opening, so let's do this show. Um, so I think this is um, an amazing uh, kind of tribute to how interesting and how important this art is, and um, that we need to continue um, talking about Ukraine, not only in the context of the war. war the war is obviously extremely important, and we have to remember that it's still happening and it's affecting um, all of the Ukrainians and beyond Ukraine. But Ukraine has more to offer than just the war, and we have this incredible rich culture that has been underrepresented, underexplored for a really long time. And so I think projects like such as this one are a good example of cultural diplomacy, and it, it's great that there is now more uh, interest and more appetite um, to, to continue staging projects like this. I actually think that Eye of the Storm also works for the present context. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. And there so was definitely, a, yeah, you're absolutely right, Olenka. And uh, there were definitely, when we were working on this exhibition, we could see how many overlaps, sadly, there are between uh, what was happening uh, back in the period at the beginning of the 20th century and how Ukrainian culture and art was constantly under, under threat and what's happening now and this this destruction is just heartbreaking that it continues uh, centuries on. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. So I wanted to ask along those lines, uh, the lines that you outlined in terms of saying that there's, Ukraine has much more to offer. So I want to begin by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we need hundreds and thousands <laughs> of such exhibitions so that people could recognize what artworks and what culture comes from Ukraine and begin to see a difference or a distinction among the various peoples, ethnicities, nationalities that make up Eastern Europe and stop labeling everything as Russia, which cont continues to happen. You will hear people say, oh, no one does that now, but believe me, everyone does that still now under uh, this horrific war. And so one of the things that I find in dealing with students and what I find amazing about uh, your catalog is that the difficulty of doing research on Ukrainian topics also stems from the fact that Ukraine has not been studied in the West. And even people living in Ukraine under the Soviet regime and only the few years of independence have not been exposed to much of their own culture. So this requires an enormous amount of work. And in the beginning, this work has to be empirical, just pulling things together. And I think that, in a way, uh, we talked about this before, this catalog shows uh, everyone, students, uh, future students, what can be explored. But what I was going to ask you, since this has to be a question, <laughs> <laughs> it have to. I wanted to ask you to outline some of the difficulties that you encounter in doing such research. Yeah. The sort of empirical difficulties, not so much about exhibition. Yes, and this is uh, because I, at the, at the Portal Institute of Art, I'm doing a PhD on Ukrainian, well, exactly this period, Ukrainian modern art, and what I've um, <coughs> encountered in my research. So a lot of homework has already been done. Um, scholars in Ukraine have done amazing work uh, to find archival documents and um, uncover some of the forgotten and unknown names. But we, what we do and still, well, we will continue to encounter this, is there are huge gaps. And this is largely due to the history of the country. So that the archive of the Ukrainian Academy of Art, for example, has not survived. So we don't know how many students enrolled in which school when he started his studio. And this is just kind of one example. There are hundreds of them. There are just not enough archival documents to really properly reconstruct what was happening um, at the time. And also, as you said, um, kind of Soviet legacy is still there, and um, how Soviet historiography and how Soviet art history was done is obviously something that we also need to challenge, and we need to bring uh, Ukrainian um, studies in, in Ukraine in line with kind of accomplishments and developments and the theories and methodologies that have been developed in the West. So that's kind of another challenge. Um, and obviously, kind of the, there are just not enough um, Ukrainian studies programs in the West, there is not enough funding, um, and so this is something that needs to be addressed systematically. And I also think that it's something that 
Ukraine needs to do a little bit more in terms of cultural diplomacy, let's be honest. Um, kind of, uh, the rare exhibitions of this uh, format and scale um, done in, in North America and in, East, uh, in Western Europe in the 90s and early 2000s, but in the last 10, 15 years there was hardly anything. And I think this is um, a massive thing that we need to address and make sure that we promote our culture, as you said, internally, because I think for many in Ukraine, some of these names will be a revelation, but also externally. So it's, um, there's a lot to be done. And that kind of leads into the next uh, question or comment about the Spets Fund, and I think a lot of people will be interested in that. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how this uh, fund was um, created and who got on the list. <clears throat> Pretty much everyone and anyone who didn't fit into the official line got on it. Um, as I said, we have a really good essay in um, in the catalog by Yulia Litvinet, and she's done, uh, with other colleagues from the National Art Museum, she's done incredible research. And in um, 2016, they actually staged an exhibition at the National Art Museum of Ukraine called Spitz Fond, where they um, exhibited probably for the first time some of the works that were hidden away for decades. Uh, but as I said, anyone and anyone could end up. So artists who were perched, um, all of their works ended up in Spitz Fund. Anything that was deemed to be at least slightly formalistic and not adhering to socialist re realism ended up in Spitz Fund. Um, kind of, I've also come across references to you know, photographs uh, of um, Ukrainian leaders from Ukrainian People's Republic, they ended up in Spetsvon. So it was a very um, all-encompassing um, holding that observed um, a lot of, um, of Ukrainian culture and, uh, and art from the period. And um, as I mentioned, uh, most of the works were supposed to be destroyed and it's um, sheer like, luck that they didn't. So. Um, the first um, time when they um, kind of works at the Spets Fund were, were to be reviewed. Um, so they've collected all of the works in the 1930s and then they've kind of started reviewing what kind of can be kind of kept but maybe not exhibited, what can be kept for kind of research or um, kind of purposes like that and what had to be destroyed. And um, when they were doing that, uh, the, the Second World War broke out. So Kiev was um, attacked by the Nazis, and so they had to um, stop that process. And um, ironically, some of the works from the Spets Fund, they were actually evacuated together with the, the rest of the collection from the National Art Museum in Ukraine to the safety in the, in the far east of the Russian Empire. And then they were returned back to Kiev after the Second World War. And again, in the 50s, this process started of looking and assessing and trying to decide what can be kept and what needs to be destroyed. And then Stalin died. Um, and so that, again, kind of that process of destinization, even though it was uh, patchy and not particularly kind of superficial in some ways, but it saved these works uh, because of kind of um, they had other things to focus on um, in, in the aftermath of his death. Um, so yeah, so it's a it's a fascinating um, story of the Spets Fund and the works that ended up uh, in it. And as I said, uh, amazing research has already been done. But again, there is more um, more scope than that for, for further exploration. And also, some of the artists, um, I don't know who they are. Like I've now, like I, I I've seen one painting by say. Um, Sinan Yofa or Konstantin Mileva, I don't, I don't know what happened. Like, um, there's just not enough research and information that has been done. I have another question, but I wanted to follow up on this. Um, are there, well, I guess, do you know of any spets fund in uh, the Russian Federation that might have Ukrainian avant-garde. I'm sure there are, and actually there are lots of works by uh, Ukrainian artists in um, in Russia um, and in state institutions in Russia, and um, that's also one of the challenges. Even before the full-scale invasion, um, I, I, as a Ukrainian researcher, didn't necessarily want to go to Russia and work in their archives and museums, but they have a wealth of information and documents and paintings and artworks that ended up in, in Russia that would be incredible for me to study um, in, in the remits of my research. Uh, there were spits ones created in, in Russia as well that not only included Ukrainian works but also works by Russian and artists of um, other cultures and nationality. So I'm not an expert on that, um, so I, I can't um, kind of explain the logistics of how it happened there. 
There was also a Spetsfond set up in the Lviv National Gallery, and very sadly that Spetsfond was not as lucky as the one in Kiev, so in the 1950s works from that Spetsfond were destroyed, and that included many of the earlier paintings by Bojuk, <coughs> Mikhailo Bojuk, for example. So, yes. Okay. Socialist in content, <laughs> nationalist in war. Uh, isn't that, I think that's uh, the slogan of Kurunizatsia. So when you think about Kurunizatsia, uh, it reaches out to the, the people or the proletariat in two forms. One, to engage the proletariat, right? Um, and to think about art as the art of the people and the art that should function in daily life. And in another way, it reaches out to the nation, the idea of nationhood and national identity. So I am uh, sure that a lot of these artists uh, came down on one or the other side mm -hmm. of this slogan to a greater or lesser degree. And I was wondering if there were tensions among artists and if you can talk a little bit more about Kurinizatsia that way. And I, before you answer, I. I teach um, Slavonic studies at the University of Cambridge. In the introduction to Russian culture class, we never talk about Kurinizatsia at the turn to um, national identities when we cover the Soviet Union. We just teach it as Russia. Just. Yeah, so um, Kurinizatsia and um, it's. Um, it's uh, the form that it's taken in Ukraine, Ukraine, etc. It was a very um, complicated period, and um, artists and writers they fought constantly. Uh, they didn't agree on how Ukrainian art and culture, or Soviet Ukrainian art and culture, should um, look like. Um, but I think in uh, uh, places like Ukraine and um, I think Georgia as well, there was a dual preoccupation with both nation and class. And that um, is something that differed um, these republics and the cultural processes in these republics from Russia proper. Because in Russia, the main focus was on the class. Um, and so um, this once again suggests uh, a, a, a separate or parallel trajectory that um, art in Ukraine and culture in Ukraine uh, was moving along before everything was centralized and kind of all the practices had to be dictated by the center. Um, when it comes to artists, it's a little bit, because when we have writers who have written in, or who were writing in Ukrainian, it's easier to say, well, they obviously were promoting Ukrainian um, culture and Ukrainian language. When it comes to artists, it's not as black and white. Um, so for example, Vasily Yermilov was a Russian speaker. Um, there were, I've come across um, references to him studying Ukrainian language in the 1920s under the Ukrainization. Um, but he, I think he continued, like he did write in, in Ukrainian um, in later years, but initially he, he was coming from a very uh, Russified background. Uh, but at the same time, he worked very closely with Ukrainian writers who were promoting a uh, very much Ukrainian uh, version of Soviet culture. And um, he, he worked with Valerian Kulashuk a lot, who was the publisher of the Ukrainian language uh, artistic journal Amon Khan. Um, but there was, and this is also kind of the case in, in other republics as well, there was no agreement on how Soviet Ukrainian, Ukrainian Soviet culture should look like. Um, artists such as Boychuk uh, looked at, to the sort of Byzantine traditions. Other artists or writers such as Mikhail Semen, because they were like, screw all of that, uh, we don't need to go back to the past. It's all kind of futuristic, urbanistic, but still in Ukrainian language. So it's, it's very difficult to disentangle and unravel all of this um, uh, narratives and um, versions of um, Ukrainian cultures that were promoted at the time. I know it's not really an answer, right. but... Um, but that, that kind of leads into the next question, and I think um, maybe some people will ask this question, so I'll ask it instead. Um, so perhaps you can give us a, a case study or two about what you think is Ukrainian, or, I mean, it's a very difficult question. Um, it's a very loaded question. <laughs> it's a very loaded question, but maybe you could highlight a couple of artists that you think embodied, perhaps, um, the idea of Ukrainian nationhood or Ukrainianism. Or yes, there are two versions. Uh, well, uh, yes, and exactly, again, I will not exactly answer your question, but um, so what we were trying to do with our 
exhibition is not necessarily, um, well, A, as I said, we were trying to um, acknowledge a very um, uh, pluralistic um, view of Ukraine that um, existed back in the day, and I think it's the case um, again today. So there were multiplicity, there was multiplicity of identities and cultures that coexisted to different degrees of uh, peacefulness uh, on the territory of Ukraine. Um, and so it, it, it's important for us to, I think, think about this period not necessarily in national terms, and that's important as well. But um, I guess to shift the conversation and show that um, these artists, they worked in Ukraine. They uh, were very actively involved in cultural processes in Ukraine. And we have to uh, study them in this uh, context and in this respect. And with artists such as Malevich, I don't particularly think that the question of whether he was Ukrainian or Russian or Polish is um, Kind of it's important, but I think what's more important is whether he belonged to to the context of Ukrainian culture, and he did, um, and that's what we we need to focus on. So we, I think we were trying to move away again with this um, Russian appropriation and kind of viewing everything through um, the very um, monolithic and kind of mono ethnic um, lens. But to your question about like what, what's Ukrainian about this artist, um, I think. Um, and again, this is not unique to Ukraine, but they um, in, engage with folk art and Ukrainian folklore. And as I say, it's not unique to Ukraine. It was done in other in, in, in Russia, but also across Europe. It was arts and crafts movement, for example, in this country. But um, folklore and folk art in Ukraine developed separately and distinctly from other nations. And I think that's what artists working in Ukraine were trying to get to the root of and they were inspired by um, distinctly Ukrainian folk traditions and one example is Alexander Exter, for example, who um, worked with the embroidery workshop um, that was set up in Ukraine by Natalia Davidova called Verbivka, and she very much recognized that these were examples of Ukrainian embroideries uh, mm -hmm. that had to be studied and preserved as such, but also She's taking um, compositional and chromatic elements of, uh, of Ukrainian embroideries and um, looked how they can be used to develop modern art. And I think that's that's fascinating. Um, there are kind of more examples like yeah, that. Another good example is how she used the pisinka, Ukrainian Easter egg, and yes. she put it onto her account. Yeah, and you, in some of her paintings you can see Ukrainian Easter eggs, Ukrainian um, um, pisinkas, which if you're not from Ukraine or you're not familiar with Ukrainian uh, whole culture, you would not necessarily recognize that that's what it is, but um, it is. Yes. I have a sort of follow-up question to that. So a lot of these, many of these artists lost their lives in the 30s in the Great Purchase, but a lot of them did not. Uh, can you tell us something about the careers of those that yeah. did not and how they survived? Yeah, so... Um, 1930s was obviously an extremely tragic period for Ukrainian culture and as I mentioned many of the artists and writers lost their life in the purges but what I'm quite keen to do and I think this is kind of the attitude that our curatorial team has is to move away from the concept of executed renaissance because what that and it, it is important to recognize that the it was tragic what happened to them and what happened to Ukrainian culture but at the same time this idea of victimhood, it's, um, it's denying agency to these practitioners and that they were actually trying to do, actively trying to do something in the 1920s and for better or worse they were in kind of working with, um, with the Soviet um, themes and kind of trying to create culture that would incorporate both Ukrainian and Soviet elements and I think it's important to recognize that. But as you say, um, not everyone um, died in the 1930s so in our exhibition, for example, some of the artists that I mentioned, Vasily Yermilov, uh, Anatoly Petrisky, and Vadim Miller, they continue to work um, through the, well, the Soviet Union so in the 50s and 60s. And again, they, they, their fates were quite um, different. So Vadim Miller and Anatoly Petrisky, they managed to adapt uh, to the changed um, situation, and um, they were extremely prolific. They were recognized as um, leading uh, artists of Soviet Ukraine. They won state awards. And I think um, one of the, you know, because they 
they obviously created paintings, but they were also working a lot in theater design. And I think theater, theater was a bit of a safe haven at that time where you could still continue to experiment a little bit, but the, the big monumental work, just canvases that you produced were very much, had to be very much in line with um, uh, socialist realism. Yermilov's um, kind of artistic uh, past was not as uh, successful, so he was accused of being a cosmopolitan in in the 19, uh, late 1930s, I think, or 1940s, and he basically couldn't work anymore. Um, so he was kicked out of the uh, Union of um, Soviet um, Artists, he didn't get any state commissions, and he was virtually unknown and forgotten for, um, for decades, and it was only in the late 1960s that his name was um, uncovered and he was still alive at the time and um, art historians, especially art historians coming from Soviet Ukraine, started to engage with his uh, work and there was a, an exhibition in Kharkiv um, of his work, um, I think shortly before he died, so in the late 1960s. So yeah, so it's um, it differed, uh, but uh, I don't think any of them had a particularly happy life, if I'm completely honest. So I think we're going to now open up the floor and uh, Q&A. Um, so if you'd like to ask some questions, um, please raise your hand. And we've got a, revol a revolving microphone. Yes, lady, person with a tree jacket. Hello, thank you so much for the brilliant presentation. I'm really excited to see the show now. Um, I'm sure you this can come to me. <laughs> but, um, so you have spent a lot of time with amazing artists that work through really stressful, really traumatic time. And like you said at the beginning, you couldn't help draw parallels of what's going on now. And then observing the artists uh, responding to, um, to the work, uh, now um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of looking back at the folklore again and rediscovering the roots through um, kind of a similar system a pattern of um, looking for their national identity basically. Um, having looked at the history of what happened in in, the, in this modern period, do you have any lessons to take out for contemporary artists of today? Um, gosh, um, I'm not um, an artist myself, so I cannot dictate artists how they um, interpret and deal with these um, events. But I think um, what is striking about that period, and I, I hope that's something that we can um, learn and um, kind of continue engaging with, is that um, Ukrainian culture was, while they were trying to, um, artists uh, back in, in the early 20th century world, they were very much um, looking to um, uh, kind of rediscover Ukrainianness and kind of construct their own culture that uh, would be separate from everything else. At the same time, they they kept quite an open eye, and um, as I said, I think many of them acknowledged the different um, cultures that coexisted um, in, in Ukraine um, at the time, but they were also very much uh, embedded in the um, artistic processes and practices that were happening um, outside Ukraine or outside Soviet Union. And so in the, in the 1920s especially, many of the artistic journals in Ukraine, they would publish articles um, dedicated to what was happening uh, in Western Europe or in America. So I think if we can, it's, it's obviously important for us to um, recognize and understand what, what happened uh, to Ukrainian culture and kind of all the um, dramatic uh, pages of Ukrainian history, but um, I think if we could keep an open eye and not narrow Ukrainian culture to a very kind of this, again, mono-ethnic Ukrainian um, idea, that, that would be great, but I think that's not kind of happening. And we have a lot of conversations in Ukraine about the communization and the Russification, and that's a very loaded um, subject right now. But I kind of hope that we can be inspired by, by that generation in their um, openness and uh, willingness to um, explore um, different things. Not sure that answers your question, but... <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Over here. Thank you, Lily. 
I think if you just hold it, please. Um, thank you so much, Katya, for your amazingly rich presentation and sort of like uh, Constance. Thanks for asking at least half of the questions I had in mind as I was listening to Katya. Uh, I'm going to ask you about the exhibition a little bit more. Um, the anecdote that you shared about babies coming back to you and saying, actually, we do have an opening, mm -hmm. uh, sounds painfully familiar <laughs> to those of us who work for the Institute and I think outside as well. Um, so rather than maybe asking you, well, how, how do we sell, as it were, Ukrainian art, Ukrainian culture, history, and so on to the outside world, um, well, maybe I will ask you that. What worked for Madrid mm -hmm. first, right? Uh, why did they have an opening? <laughs> Um, but the other question, uh, the, the sort of this, the other side of that question is, uh, what are the obstacles still? I mean, one would think that Ukraine is now, for all the wrong reasons, firmly on the mental maps of the world. Um, why are they still sending us to 2026 program or whatever, you know, sending us away? Why isn't there a queue to um, host an exhibition of this kind? Um, yeah, once we know those obstacles, maybe we can you know, uh, begin to think how to overcome them. Yeah, thank you, Alessia. Um, so what happened in Madrid, and this is where we were extremely fortunate, we had one person who was the key person who bought into the idea, and who uh, was Francesca thyssen Bornemisa, who is on the board of the thyssen Bornemisa Museum. And she is um, a philanthropist, an art collector in her own right, and um, she sort of she became a complete, well, she's, she's a force of nature, she doesn't take no as an answer. So she harassed the museum director until there was a yes. And um, not only she harassed the museum, because she's so well connected in the field, uh, she actually created um, Ukrainian um, Museums for Ukraine, an initiative that started um, a, providing financial, financial um, support to uh, some of the museums of U in Ukraine, but also she <coughs> gave money for our exhibition because the museum didn't have enough uh, in, in their budget. So I think it's finding those key supporters and uh, patrons who will kind of champion the cause and um, march with it. That, that's, that's key. Um, why there is still... Uh, not resistance, but not as much, um, you know, um, well, not enthusiasm, but why there is still kind of this obstacles that we need to, well, we need to recognize that museums, both in this country and um, in, um, in in Europe and in North America, they're extremely unflexible. <laughs> so they have their, like, set, and they are under incredible financial uh, pressure, and also now they cannot take money from Russian oligarchs. So um, it's kind of, there are a lot of things that are playing um, here, but I think we're definitely seeing, and this is a very positive, um, there is more appetite, and there is definitely, as you're saying, Ukraine is firmly on the uh, mental, um, kind of, uh, is, is firmly kind of acknowledged that need, more needs to be done. Um, so I think there will be more, uh, but we need to be, I think we as Ukrainians, especially over the last year, we're so impatient for right, for, for right reasons, uh, but we, and we have to recognize that it, it just doesn't happen overnight here, and there, there needs to be a systematic change that will, have, will, will take time. And again, what I said about the fact that there are not enough Ukrainian studies programs, there are not enough chairs uh, for Ukrainian um, history or culture and the institutions in the West, and all of this will take time and money and also um, some effort from our side as well. Thank you, Candice. Thank you very much for an amazing presentation, amazing images. Um, two kind of lay persons' questions, really different, uh, but I guess I'm not with them. Uh, so the theoretical one first, I don't understand when people talk about formalism in Ukraine uh, in opposition to uh, Soviet culture, what they mean. It's quite hard for me to get hold of them. I'd love to help with that. And I realize that's a big question. It's more than um, and the second one, about Bob Mazel. I'm, I, I'm familiar with lots of his, I guess, is it charcoal drawings? Or is it... Is yes, it he has a lot of... Um... Oh, it's so amazing to see those color images. And, and tell us, uh, are there more uh, works in color by him, and, and how many, and where are they? Because those were just, I always want to ask if you can look at them again. Anyway. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pichar. Um, I will start with the second part because that's a bit easier. <laughs> um, so Bagamazov, um, it's, it's actually an incredible story because most of his works have survived and that includes as you said, he, he did a lot of drawings, uh, but he also painted a lot in um, oil. And the reason why his work survived is because of his incredible wife and then widow, uh, Vanda Monasterska, who was uh, an artist in her own right. But when her husband died, she made it her life's uh, mission to preserve his works. Um, so we have, there are lots and lots of drawings and paintings by Bagamazov out there. Many of them have left Ukraine, so they are both in, in institutions and in private collections. There is a very a nice um, selection of his drawings at the Krolin Müller Museum in Otkulu in the Netherlands. Um, if you haven't been there, I mean, it's, it's stunning and they, um, the works are amazing, but it's also great that they uh, look at Bogomazov in the context of uh, futurism in Europe more broadly and they juxtapose his works with um, the likes of Giacomo Bala and um, Arhitenko as well. So it, it's, it's, it's a nice little group that they have there. But that's not the, the only example. And um, in this country especially, um, you have a champion of Bogomazov in the, in the um, in in James Butterwick, who has his own uh, gallery in London, but he's been doing amazing work in promoting um, Bogomazov as an as an incredible artist and a real genius. So yes, there are a lot of works out there, and we really want to do an exhibition on Bogomazov. So hopefully, we'll be able to do that uh, soon because in our exhibition at the moment, we so we have six drawings by him and one oil. Uh, well, two oils. So we have one early oil um, from his futuristic period and then the, the big canvas that you saw uh, from, from the late 1920s. Um, we hope to uh, show more by him, especially in London, because there are lots of works um, here. Uh, but there is wells of material in Bagamazov. There is definitely that's one of uh, one of the rare examples when the, actually we have a lot of works um, to work with, which is incredible. To your um, first question about the, the kind of difference between formalism and socialist realism, I, sadly I don't have um, images of like quintessentially socialist realist uh, realism um, paintings, but I think the main difference is that um, socialist realism, as the name suggests, is very much real, realistic painting and. Um, so any notion of um, experimentation with, with form was abundant, it was very kind of narrow, this is how like, you draw it as it is, uh, well not exactly as it is, but you draw it as it is, but also you kind of, the, the, the image that you create is of the brighter, better future, so it's, it's realistic in its uh, form, but it's not particularly realistic because that didn't reflect the reality of the Soviet Union when those works were created, so it's kind of aspirational how um, Soviet um, life should um, look like. Um, that doesn't, I, I know that doesn't give you much, but if I had um, images it would be a little bit easier I guess to point out the, um, the differences, but I guess the main thing is that um, artists were no longer allowed to exper like, experiment in any shape or form basically. It was a very prescribed formula that they had to follow in their art. So you could do things like color fields. Mm -hmm. You had to be very narrow. Your yeah, so work like Bagamazov that I showed um, um, at the end with this like explosion of colors that wouldn't happen in socialist realism. I think the lady with um, red necklace was had her hand up for a while, so. Thank you for this presentation. And I have a question regarding Sonia Delanet and the other artists who was educated outside Ukraine, uh, become an artist outside Ukraine, and in case of Sonia Delanne, actually did not emphasize their origin much. So could you elaborate how did you frame the belonging to modernism in Ukraine? Sure, thank you. Um, yes, and it, it, again, it's a complicated question, and um, we, just because she was born in Ukraine doesn't necessarily mean that she was a Ukrainian or was influenced by um, a Ukrainian um, culture. And uh, in, 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 in the case of uh, Sonia Delonets, she was born in, in a Jewish family in Odessa. She left uh, Odessa quite at a, quite a young age and moved to St. Pittsburgh where she was educated in, uh, or raised in the family of her 
maternal uncle. She then studied in Germany and later on settled, you know, Elizabeth or kind of um, other members of the audience, um, and then settled in Paris where uh, she uh, became, um, she married Robert Dolanet and uh, together they um, kind of, the, the art sort of complemented each other, though they were um, amazing artists in their own right. Um, and you are right to point out that it's it's a difficult thing because she, she hardly spent any life in, in Ukraine. But interestingly enough, in her memoirs, um, she does, um, she has recollections about the sort of vivid colors of Ukrainian, especially peasant um, dressing, and she explicitly uh, talks about uh, the wedding costumes of Ukrainian uh, peasants and all the bright ribbons that uh, Ukrainian uh, girls uh, wear um, uh, during uh, during the wedding. So it is a it is a tenacious link, but again, I think it is important to um, to recognize that this there is more to this artist than what we kind of acknowledge, and I think. Ukrainian angle is an interesting one to investigate, um, and it hasn't been as uh, explored as, say, her Russianness or her Jewishness or her Frenchness. So um, I think, kind of, yeah, that, that's that's how we're framing it. We're not saying that they were Ukrainian per se, but we're saying that it's still interesting to look at them through this um, lens. Excuse me, can I uh, add your answer? In usual. If memoir, yeah, self identification, yeah, Ukrainian or Jewish or some people, self identification. Right? Yeah, and self identification is very important. In the case of Sonia Dolanet, she didn't identify as Ukrainian, but she did recollect this kind of part of uh, Ukrainian culture. Uh, and yes, it is it is an important question how artists identified themselves, but we also need to be aware of that how we identify ourselves today is not necessarily how they approached identity, especially national identity at the time, and we need to remember about the imperial context um, that they um, were born into, they grew up into, and so very often it's, uh, you cannot just place them in one box, it was a very hyphenated identity and we need to recognize this different strand, the strands and I think that's what makes it extremely interesting and, and vibrant. But again, as I say, and this is something that we are battling with, is this very monolithic, russocentric interpretation that has been inflicted on many of these artists for a very long time and that's something that needs to be addressed because it's just historically inaccurate and uh, yeah, and that's that's why kind of again, but we don't want to do the same thing. We don't want just to put a Ukrainian straitjacket on all of the Russian Russian artists or whatever. So it is it is a complicated um, process, and there are a lot of nuances that that need to be um, addressed as we um, continue to to research. But yes, self identification is definitely a very important question, and there are some artists who undeniably undeniably identified, like Mikhailo Bychuk 100% identified as Ukrainian, that's kind of quite straightforward. But it's not the case in many other examples. Um, my name is Olga, I work in Ukrainian Institute uh, London, but I studied history in Kiev Tereshchenko University, and I really thank you for this lecture because even I found out a lot of interesting and new information for myself. Um, but I have a question and um, some information. For example, um, Kazimir Malevich, uh, Ukrainian artist, I'm sure there are people who didn't know it's Ukrainian artist, they thought it's Russian artist, and at the beginning of full-scale war, Tina Kandalaki is one of uh, um, a popular hosts in Russia, and now she's in propaganda. She was uh, saying on the rallies in Russia, saying that Kazimir Malevich is Russian artist, and accusing Ukraine that we are saying it's Ukrainian mm -hmm. artist. Uh, not many people know that he has been forced to uh, go to Russia and he wanted to leave Russia, but he was not allowed to leave Russia and a lot of his art was um, kept and still kept in Russia. Uh, at the beginning of the lecture you said war is war, but we need to uh, learn our history and art. Uh, 
but from my experience here in London, um, the same happened with Shedrick Alentovich mm -hmm. 100 years ago. I've heard so many people here saying that didn't know it was Ukrainian uh, composer. Uh, so my question is, uh, how can you use uh, what are you doing now, all these exhibitions and um, telling the world about Ukrainian cu culture, actually to tell the truth about Ukraine, what is happening now. Um, because as uh, was said before, what ha was happening 100 years ago, a lot of is the happening. History is repeating itself. Yes, yeah. history is uh, repeating itself. And, um, they say culture and sport is out of politics, you know, but how can we use this culture uh, for politics, for Ukraine, and to actually um, to win this cultural war? Thank you, Thank you Olga. Um, well, I think um, it is exactly with projects like this and with the work that the Ukrainian <coughs> Institute is doing in Ukraine that we can uh, promote and uh, diversify um, the region and show that there is more to it than just uh, this Russian perspective. Um, when it comes to Kazimir Malevich, and um, I mean, I don't want to go into the perverted reality that Russians live in right now, that's not kind of... Just not for Russians, for the world. I know, I know, but I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, but I think what is important uh, for Ukrainians, and this is the message that we should be um, sending out there in, in the world is, again, I mean, Malevich is a complicated one, um, uh, but uh, we do need to talk about this art and this you know, cultural uh, culture in the context of Ukraine and point out to the fact that it's not just all Russian. I completely agree with that. At the same time, I do think that we need to have a more nuanced uh, view, and it's difficult in the in the current um, situation, in, in, when we're battling this unbelievable genocidal war, to to stay nuanced. We do want to see everything as black and white, but it's more complicated than that. So it is important to talk about Malevich as a Ukrainian artist, and we have to uh, drum into kind of on all the corners that that's the case, but we also have to recognize that he wasn't just Ukrainian. He was born into a Polish family. He spoke Polish as his uh, native language. Because of the imperial context, he, he couldn't study in Ukraine, so he did have to go uh, to Russia. But he developed artistically in, in, in Russia, and we, we kind of have to acknowledge that. So it's, I think what I'm trying to say is that it would be good for us Ukrainians that we could promote a, mus like a very nuanced, well, advocating for our culture and our heritage to promote a much more nuanced view of it than what Russians are doing when they just appropriate everything and put this like, this is Russian, uh, don't touch it. So I think this is what we're trying to do with this exhibition and with the publication. And yeah, this uh, kind of, I think the more of such projects we do, the, the better, and I think the message will start to sink in um, slowly but surely. Um, yeah. that, um, I, I think to add to that, um, so there was a definitive book written in the 60s, um, uh, The Great Experiment. Oh, yeah, by yeah. Camilla Gray. Yeah. Camilla Gray, and she kind of defined everything as Russian. And maybe we need to have that rewritten. Yeah, yes, so the, 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 there just need to be more research, more publications, more projects that will um, promote this more multifaceted kind of idea of um, culture and art coming out of what used to be the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union. So I think we have t um, time for one more question. William here. You're getting a good workout. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for such a, uh, an amazing talk and, and such a, a great discussion. Um, my question is kind of follows on to the, what we've been discussing already, and it's about the, um, you mentioned the Kotori, uh, uh, and I was really interested to see that there's like a separate section on that in the, um, in the exhibition. And I wonder what your view is of what Ukraine should do with its Jewish cultural heritage in general, kind of in, in the way that it's currently, you know, it's currently reinventing itself in the eyes of the world and showing its, its culture and showing Ukrainian culture, but also like what you've been saying through your whole talk and the whole discussion, actually the multicultural nature of Ukraine. Um, I wonder, yeah, I'd be really interested to hear your view and what, what Ukraine should do with its Jewish artistic cultural heritage. 
Thank you. It's a very good question, and again, it's it's quite a complicated one. <laughs> um, I think um, again, it is important for us to um, recognize that well, what Cultural League was doing was very much promoting their own. Um, well, they were referring to it as Yiddish, but Jewish culture, and that was different from, say, Ukrainian or Russian or Polish. But at the same time, um, I think the way we in Ukraine can approach it is to recognize that there was a moment in time when the, the environment was created for Jewish culture to flourish in Ukraine, and that was not always the case. We have a very complicated um, uh, history, and we have to remember about it. We have to remember about the pogroms, we have to remember um, that it Kind of this moment of Cultural League is a rare example when um, Ukrainian and Jewish could coexist peacefully and actually um, Ukrainians could promote um, Jewish culture, Jewish artists could promote uh, Ukrainian culture, they could exhibit together and things like that, but that was not always the case and, um, and so I think we need to be very sensitive um, and very honest with ourselves as well that um, yeah, it's we we have a lot to uh, work through in our own history and how um, kind of the history of how Ukraine or Ukrainians coexisted with other nations. So um, yes, it's it's again a process that um, will happen hopefully. Okay, if I could just follow up really briefly, could you give us maybe like some details on how those different groups like interacted and collaborated with one another in the, in the Yes, um, so uh, Culture League was quite a sort of standalone uh, organization and um, it was um, extremely uh, multidimensional. So um, they ran a lot of uh, schools for uh, kids, they had their own theater, they had their own, as I said, art section. So they created their own uh, museum of Jewish art, which they collected. Um, items, but at the same time they didn't operate in a vacuum. Um, so they are very much um, attuned to what ha was happening in, um, in Ukraine more broadly. And for example, one of the members of like of the older generation uh, from the Cultural League, Abra Abraham Manevich, he was one of the founders of the Ukrainian uh, National or Ukrainian Art Academy in 1917. So there was definitely a lot of um, dialogue and um, Kind of overlap between what the artists were doing and also many younger artists from Culture League, they, they studied with Exeter, they studied in the studio and they were particularly drawn to this idea of uh, merging sort of uh, national elements and folklore with artistic with modernist experimentation that was one of the kind of selling things of Exeter's um, studio and so um, Boris Arens and Isaac Rabinovich who were active members of um, Culture League and they actually uh, and the manifesto of Jewish artists, they, they were students of Exodus. Um, so, yeah, but this is something, again, there were a couple of uh, very nice exhibitions that were done um, in Ukraine uh, dedicated to Culture League, and um, I think there is a really good catalog. But again, these links need to be explored more. Definitely. So, I'd like to call upon um, Maria Montagu from the Ukrainian Institute of London, the Deputy Director. Director, to say some closing words, please. Thank you very much, Constance. Thank you so much to all of you for coming, and thank you to our panel, and a massive congratulations to Katya for her work on this extraordinary exhibition. It's really a landmark achievement in decolonizing our knowledge on this art, mm -hmm. and I think that it's very important, the nuance that you were just speaking about, and I think it's exactly this nuance and freedom to be a place of nuance that Ukraine is fighting for, for nuance and diversity. And it's, and it's fantastic to be having a complex conversation about this art and uh, the importance of understanding it, certainly not to be Russian, but to be thinking about the diversity of it and what a diverse and exciting place Ukraine was at this time yes. and yes. is and, and continues to be. Um, so thank you for this conversation. Um, as Charlotte mentioned at the start, this is the first collaboration between Ukrainian Institute London, Cambridge Ukrainian Studies, we've worked with quite a lot in the past, well, a lot, a, a great deal, um, but it's fantastic to be working together with the Courtauld Institute, and as all of the speakers have said today, there really is just so much work for us to continue doing in broadening knowledge about Ukrainian culture, and I think that this cross-institutional um, collaboration uh, is very important in that respect. We really hope that it will be the first of many more events like this. 
Um, and we really hope that you will all be able to stay now to join us for drinks um, at our reception. And please do buy a copy of um, the fantastic catalogue of the exhibition. And don't miss the chance to get this discount. <laughs> um, and thank you so much again to Katya, Denise Avalenka, Pervni, and Constant Vision for this absolutely inspiring discussion. Thank you.